Hello and welcome again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been coming at you since 2003, serving the fishing community with fishing reports, fishing news, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now the ever popular Saltwater Podcast Series. In the Saltwater Podcast series, we call on our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and get them to share with us their insights on how to catch more fish more often up and down the North Carolina coast. But truth be told, what we're really, I think, trying to accomplish is just to get more people spending more time on the water with family and friends, and then the fish is a byproduct of that shared community time together. So this week, we are featuring Chris Tryon of Hook, Line, and Paddle kayak store here in Wrightsville Beach, Wilmington area. And Chris is going to do sort of a primer for getting, uh, what do we see here, summer inshore kayak fishing for beginners. Summer inshore kayak fishing for beginners. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus, I think, in this issue primarily on flounder and red drum summer inshore fishing. He's going to talk about paddle versus pedal options when it comes to kayaks. We're going to talk about some simple rigging strategies when it comes to kayaks. And then we're going to move into locations and techniques when it comes to summer kayak inshore fishing. I'm joined this week, just like I'm joined every week, my co-host Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. What's up, Gary? Good to see you, man. It's good to see you. It's good to see you close up. I know, right? We're getting close here on the set. This is perfect. We have a community here. We're probably going to get in trouble. This Someone's is going to be a great movie. episode. This is going to be awesome, An man. intimate episode. I can, don't say that, Gary. That's how close we are. It's going to be good, man. How have you been? You been good? I've been good. All right. Doing any fishing? Yes. Perfect. I haven't. So, whatever. Loser. No, I'm just <laughs> I can't say that. I'm sorry, Gary. I take it back. That's all right. All right. Let's talk about how to watch, how to listen. If you're listening, you obviously know how to do that. If you're watching, you obviously know how to do that. But if you don't know how to do the opposite, uh, you can check it out here on the screen. Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. You can listen or watch us on YouTube. And be sure to subscribe to our channels. Be sure to like and share those as well. Uh, If you think we're doing a good job, leave us a comment. Um, Actually got some interesting comments, Gary, from from some people. So I'm, I'm now known as Billy, a.k.a. the other guy. Yeah, I don't even think there's Billy A.K.A. in there. I think it's just good job, Gary, and the other guy. I think that's my favorite comment so far. So, dear commenter, you're welcome. You're welcome for all my hard work from the other guy. Um, All right, cool. Well, let's go ahead and get into our sponsor shout-out. Is Marine Warehouse here in Wilmington, North Carolina. So, we're going to go ahead and roll a little 26-second clip. Stick uh, with us. Here we go. This is Robbie at Marine Warehouse Center, and we're excited to announce... And we're the exclusive North and South Carolina Sailfish dealer. Sailfish offers an offshore capable boat with tons of family friendly features. Whether you're a hardcore offshore fisherman or you just want to island hop, Sailfish can do it all. The offer's still out there if anybody wants to buy me a Sailfish. I'm totally good. If you want to donate one so I can go do some more fishing, that'd be awesome. Speaking of fish. Speaking of fish. You want to see one? Um, well, no, actually, I had. Uh, <laughs> I do want to see a fish, but before I see a fish, um, I uh, talked oh, to Emmett about your sailfish. Um, All right. We have to continue that conversation. He's undecided. But it brings to <laughs> oh, mind, man. it brings to mind a little known fact about Emmett. All right, here we go. I'm excited. This is my favorite part of the show. So Emmett and I, just this past weekend, went head-to-head Spanish mackerel fishing in the Spanish mackerel open, and Emmett weighed in two more Spanish mackerel than I did. How would that make you feel, Gary? What I'm saying is, is that a truth fact? I think it is true. It's true. It's true. It is true. I weighed in zero, and he weighed in two. How many did your kids weigh in? Zero. So your boat weighed in no fish. Oh, we caught one bluefish. In your own tournament. We caught one bluefish in my own tournament. That's perfect, man. At least you didn't win it. I was nervous for you if you win your own tournament. I think there's little. (laughs) I think that's why I fish it. Because you have a little chance of winning? The participants are safe from that potential drama of me saying, and the winner is me. (laughs) 
That's perfect. Now I'd love to see a fish photo. Now I'm going to show you one right here. Let's see. Where did he go? Here he is. This is Andrew Glubba from Man- uh, Manio with a flounder caught and released uh, using a dirty, hairy fly near the Oregon Inlet. So good-looking fish on a fly rod, too. I like that. Fly rod. It's in his lap. He's in a kayak. That's yeah. an appropriate fish perfect. photo with our kayak guest speaker today. Sounds good, man. And so here's what I want. I know that you've been thinking about buying a kayak. You've been <laughs> for, thinking about kayak fishing. For like 50 years. <laughs> so when I'm done talking with Chris here, I'm going to come back to you. and I'm going to ask for Billy's All right, man. best takeaway. I'm ready. Billy's best takeaway. Billy's best takeaway from what Chris says. From what Chris says. Chris and I are pretty good friends, so this shouldn't be too difficult. We talk about kayak fishing quite a bit. Maybe you'll finish his sentences. I probably will. That's probably... If you guys hear something, it's going to be me just... Chris Tryon of Hook, Line, and Paddle here in the Wrightsville, Wilmington area. Welcome to the show. But before we go any further, I don't want to waste my participants' time. Please tell me why anyone should listen to what you have to say about kayak fishing. Well, I started uh, 2002, 2003 fishing out of a kayak, but before that grew up doing it out of a canoe. Um, And just started working at the store I ended up owning. Started when kayak fishing was kind of young and had been in the industry and had been, you know, manufacturers talked to me, asked me my opinions on design and stuff like that because it is a small platform and we got to make it as efficient as possible. Right on. Um, I like our concept today. I like that we're going to do, we started with summer inshore kayak fishing. And then we decided we were going to focus, you know, instead of trying to be comprehensive, we're going to focus a little bit more on red drum and flounder since they are closely related in technique and style. And I like that we also added that we're going to do this for beginners so that we're also going to help people make some choices about kayaks, make some choices about rigging, but then absolutely move into locations and techniques. So I like everything about that. But before we get to the meat of the matter, we have a feature on this podcast series called Two Questions. These are two non-fishing related questions. Are you ready, Chris? I am ready. Kayak is a word spelled the same forward and backwards And the term for that kind of word or phrase is a... I want to say anagram, but I'm wrong. Yeah, you're wrong. Uh, P palindrome. Palindrome. All right. That's okay. How long did it take Billy to figure that out? I I didn't even... Billy didn't know. He He would have failed that question too. So now, Chris, your second question. Give me another palindrome of at least four letters or more. Don't give me mom. Anna. All right. You successfully passed it. I couldn't say kayak, though, could I? No, you couldn't. I said another one. So you're good. You're great. And I think people are ready for us to talk fishing. So, Chris, with the focus on red drum and flounder, I want to have plenty of time to talk about technique and location, but there are certainly decisions to make. If I'm a beginner, there's decisions to make, and I think it starts with kayak, and I think the primary categories there are pedal versus paddle. Give me a primer. So I think the the real question we get a lot in the shop is I want to go kayak fishing and our normal response is in well, how and they we gotta get a blank stare because a lot of our customers are kind of green to the sport they've they've watched YouTube videos they're kind of figuring it out and then they actually come in the shop and don't realize there's a little bit more of a selection than like a sit in or a sit on top um, you know if you're not gonna pedal if you're gonna stay inshore. If you need something that doesn't self bail, um, there's some options on the market. Uh, my favorite's the Ultimate FX from Native. It's designed to stand up, and its original design was to fly fish out of. So if that's kind of the road you want to go down, stand up, side cast, pole, it doesn't have to be with a fly rod. That's that that was kind of the road that took that that boat down. There's an answer to that question. We we really want to figure out where and how you want to fish, and then figure out the right kayak to put you in. So for the basic beginner like what is where would you push them if they were indecisive if they were looking for guidance is it stand up is it pedal is it paddle like how do you help me if i didn't know how would you help me make up that decision so i think the the, like i said you know if you want to if you came in and said "I, i like you spanish mackerel fishing so that's offshore we might try to rail you back into maybe a sit on top that self bails. It's going to work just as fine inshore. But if you do want to poke out every once in a while into the ocean, you know any water comes in is going to drain out. So we're going to fix that problem. We're going to give you a, a well-rounded, almost silver bullet. 
a lot of kayaks now for fishing have moved have moved to that stand up. So they're a little bit wider designed to stand up, and there's not a lot on the market now than you know ten years ago that were more sit down and there was like one or two you could stand in. So it's kind of the paradigm shift's kind of gone to to stand up. And so we're gonna put you in somewhere on a twelve foot kayak because they displace water. So length is gonna give you speed and tracking. It's gonna it's gonna glide better through the water. It's gonna be more efficient to get there. So a twelve foot and is that pretty standard? So again with with my focus or our focus today on inside red drum and flounder pedal versus paddle and length i'm sorry if i've missed that no yeah so uh for the length you know we want we're going to be around 12 to 14 feet mostly we're going to be like 12 to 13 and a half and why is that why is that a good size so they're they they displace water like a sailboat so that length gives them more efficiency and more speed through the water you're going to carry that power through one stroke of a paddle Um, when you're going for your next stroke you're kind of off the gas pedal so 12 foot and up is going to want to glide further across the water so what a little shorter than that, they tend to want to slow down faster. So you kind of leapfrogging across the water. So, you know, 12 is kind of the sweet spot. And then if you want a little bit more speed and a little bit more carrying capacity of gear you can bring with you, you might move to a 13, 13, 5. And they're all pretty stable when I get to the stand-up part of this operation? Yeah, it wasn't something like we got a boat that was 34 inches wide and someone said, hey, can you stand in it? Well, let me see. Um, they were designed with that intent, you know, with the hull design and all that kind of dihedral drill or uh, native kind of first came out with theirs. They call it a tunnel hull, and it was almost like pontoons built into the bottom of it. So you had that ability to stand. And am I more likely to want a paddle or a pedal? I am on the fence. I do both. But, you know, I have a few, I have a handful of kayaks. You know, most of my, most customers or most people getting into the sport are, are looking for that one kayak to fish out of. Um, for me, if I'm going to do something quick in the morning before work, I'd rather just take a paddle. I can slide out of the bed of my truck, hop in, go fish for an hour or so, throw it back in the truck, go to work. If I'm going out for the day, I want to pedal. Um, I'm going to get around faster because you're pedaling. Um, you're going to go longer because you're using larger muscles. You know, your legs compared to your arms are stronger, so you're going to cover more ground. Uh, and again, you're in that 12 to 13 and a half range. That might be the only caveat where someone might look at getting a 10 footer. Um, because you're pedaling, there's no kind of gas on, gas off as you are paddling. So you could do a 10-foot um, in, re- in that respect. But other than that, I'd stay, stay in that 12-foot 12 12 foot plus range. And so, you know, to get, I guess, like the simple approach to this. So I, I've got my kayak. You've helped me out. Or I've done my YouTube videos, mm-hmm. or, you know, or whatever. And then, you know, we have a pedal, a paddle that we have to purchase, you know, life jacket, or whatever the vocabulary is for yep. what I'm strapping around my waist. What are some other like sort of simple rigging decisions that I can make? I mean, I know I can accessorize to the nines. I'm guessing yeah. the market will allow me to spend any amount of money on any number of accessories. But if if I'm a beginner and I'm saying, man, I, you know, I'll spend some money down the road, but just get me on the water, set up for success and comfortable. A couple of the accessories you recommend for that beginner kayak fisherman would be. I would say an anchor trolley. It's going to allow you to face any kind of wind or current direction because you can position that anchor anywhere on the boat. Uh, it works in a, like a pulley system, so you can move that anchor bow to stern. So you can, you're can you not going to be dictated which way you're going to face by wind or current. You can make that change. That's going to come along with a cleat that you'd add to the side of the kayak to tie for your anchor. Or if you're in shallow water, you know, a stakeout pole, something, you know, power pole or something like that, those fiberglass poles. Um, a lot of them come with at least a rod holder or two already molded in. If not, maybe one, if not two. In uh, the more modern kayaks, you know, 15 years ago when it started getting hot, where do you want your rod holder? We, we broke the drill bit out with a hole saw, drilled the hole, mounted your rod holder. Now they use tra- aluminum tracking, and there's tabs they put in the rod holder. So you can add them, remove them, slide them forward, slide them back. So the fact that you can come back down the road, like, well, let's start with two. I can't imagine fishing more rods you kind of progress like, well, I want to be able to troll a little bit. I like to soak some live bait while I'm one direction while I'm doing a pop and cork the other direction. <clears throat> it's not a bring the boat back. We got to cut into it, install a new product, and then have you show back up again to pick it up. It's what kind of rod holder you going to, what kind of rod are you using? All right. There's the rod holder for you. You slide around your track system. All right. So 
Man, can you give me a little bit more? I'm intrigued by the anchoring system you said where I can position my boat and point it in any different direction as opposed to just setting out an anchor and tying a line to my kayak. How does that work? So it's going to work with two pulleys. There's going to be one at the bow, one at the stern, and that rope's going to come all the way through them. It's going to come back to a ring. So one rope's going to tie directly to the ring. The other rope's going to tie to a hook so you can clip it. And through that ring is where you're going to either run your anchor line through or you can put your stakeout pole through. So once you're anchored, if the current was coming you know, from you to me, and I wanted to fish towards you, I'd run that anchor to the bow. I'd face that direction. If I wanted to fish facing backwards, I could run that anchor trolley all the way to the stern and my kayak will swing completely around. And so anywhere in between bow and stern, you can turn that kayak to face a certain, you know, if you wanted to fish a grass line. But if you just throw the anchor off the bow, it's not going to allow you to fish it efficiently. That anchor trolley will you change your position and okay. face the way you want to go. So it's almost if we were on your boat and we were – Anchored up on the bow, the current changed. It'd be better if we we're anchored up off the stern. I could untie it, walk the anchor back, retie it off, and we're done. Well, we're not going to walk around the kayak, and that—that's kind of essentially what you're doing with that, with that trolley system. Okay, I follow that. Now, you and I talked before the episode. We said we're going to do a trip to hook, line, and paddle, where we can go into much more detail about rigging and even kayak options. Yeah. But what we said is we want to talk about fishing. So I know I'm guessing. I think you even mentioned this. Someone buys a kayak from you, you almost expect the question, so where do you suggest I go to try to catch some fish? Yeah, I give them all your spots. <laughs> My spots are unproductive according to the Spanish mackerel tournament. <laughs> right, yeah. I hope you're not charging much for my spots. I'm a great fisherman when I'm on the boat with someone else, but I'm not go. a great fisherman on my boat. <laughs> so people love the location. The location, people love that question. They love sort of some help there. Mm -hmm. Now for kayak fishing, and I think what you can do, I think, I don't want to speak for you. You can give me some specifics for kayak fishing inshore for the kayak guy in the Wrightsville Beach, Wilmington area. But you might also have some suggestions for people no matter where you live. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. All so, right, what do you got? So this area, um, you know, the Wrightsville Beach boat ramp's a little tough. There's not a lot of single vehicle parking. Now, if you've got a larger fishing kayak on a trailer, that solves your problem. You're attached trailer, so you can park one of the trailer spots. Um, Trails End Road. The Trails End Road Park has quite a bit um, single vehicle parking. That's going to put you in the ICW behind Masonboro. Um, again, they have some a little bit better parking down at Carolina Beach at that boat ramp. Uh, Carolina Beach State Park. Um, you know, there's tons of parking there to launch. Um, River Road Park a little bit further down the road. I'm sorry, a little bit further up the road from from Carolina Beach State Park. Um, and Fort Fisher down at the basin is uh, you know has ample. You because know, most people are able to either put their kayak in the back of their truck or it's light enough they can put on their roof. So you need to, you know, we try to think about places that have, you know, single vehicle parking, not with attached trailer because, you know, there's tickets and stuff you can get for that. And, you know, guys with trailers get a little upset when you park in their spot. And then you, I think you also mentioned something about if you, you can go on a certain website, not that you necessarily have to have that web address, but there's a certain website that will not only guide you to, boat ramps but it also say which are more kayak friendly but even if a boat ramp isn't listed as kayak right it's still you can still use it um explain it, that to me so uh it's uh, my readers it's my NC, it's it's a uh, nc wildlife or uh, the, the a wildlife resource commission and under their boating tab um you there's a where to boat section and it pulls up a kind of a version of like google map and it has every wildlife resource commission ramp on it and it also has a few city and city and county you know, if they've given them the, the information, they'll put it on that map. So if you're in Wilmington and you always hear people, you know, well, the red fishing's great around the haystacks up around Swansboro. Well, I, I know where Swansboro is, but I don't know where to put in at. You can, you can find a ramp, you know, that, and sometimes you read in the description, it'll say no canoe kayak access, which really translates to not a dedicated place to launch your canoe or kayak. Not that you can't use, you take your kayak there. You're just going to use the, the concrete ramp like like the like the power boaters are going to do okay so it's not a you can't use me it's we just don't have something dedicated for you all right so what are we going to do man let's pick one of those spots like sort of walk me through a little bit let's say trails in okay and i've got my kayak i want to go catch a flounder red drum something on that vein what am i doing when i paddle away from that boat ramp so this is one question this is a que this is a question I answered a long time ago differently. Uh, now a lot of people 
they're making fish finders and batteries small enough that people put them on their kayaks. They can kind of figure out, you know, the topography of the bottom, like where the holes are, where the flats are. You know, before it became easier to do, we used to say, people, pick your spot and go at dead low tide. Where there's no water, it's going to be skinny when it's high. Where there's a lot of water, it's a deep hole. Um, and, and you kind of had to kind of go through that motion. And then, you know, Google Maps came out, Google Earth came out. They fly all those photos at low tide on the coast. Um, so you can kind of do a map recon of the area too. You can kind of figure out like, oh, this is where the deep holes are. These are the shallow spots. So if we're fishing, um, you know, a rising or a falling tide, like leaving the boat ramp, you're right there at Whiskey Creek, um, and right there around the marina. So there's some options in that area. Um, there's ample docks along the intercoastal waterway that you can use to target. You know, when I, if I'm fishing a line of docks in my kayak for reds, I'm going to work one set of pylons, you know, one side of the dock, um, I catch a red or I don't, but before I move to the next one, I've always, I found that you can, I've picked up flounder laying in between them. So I'll work a dock pile into the shore and then I'll work the shore back to me hoping for a flounder and then I'll turn and I'll work the next set of dock pile. And so it's, you know, it's, this is their species that cohabitate the same area. So you just get zoned in on redfish. You might have missed a really good flounder day. <laughs> you know, if you're just like, I'm just fishing pilings for reds and you paddled over, you know, maybe the flounder of your life. So if I'm targeting docks, we'll start with docks, you know, out of Trails End or out of wherever. If I'm targeting docks, like, and again, I'm, my, my knowledge of kayak fishing is limited, man. My, my trips have been limited. Is it infinitely easier to just bang those docks with soft plastics? How hard is it to, to offer other things like the bait, the, you know, bait fishing as well? Yeah, you can do both. I mean, I would think with soft plastic, you can, you're can you going to cover more ground than you would kind of soak in bait, um, which could be a good or a bad thing. You know, if you're if you're working that bait too fast, you might be, you know, not leaving the presentation long enough for those reds to pick it up. You know, if they're hungry, you know, we're getting warmer. We're in the middle of June, you know, the first day of summer, Saturday, it's supposed to be like 90 and humid. That water is warm. Those fish are active. Earlier in the spring, you know, tell people you know, fish a little bit slower, you know, a little bit more lethargic. Um but yeah, you could soak bait or, you know, if you can set yourself up again, like with an anchor trolley where you get yourself positioned right with an extra rod holder in that kayak, you could chuck live bait off one direction away from you and then work soft plastic. So, I mean, you got two rods, why aren't they fishing? And this is, I'm again going to show my lack of knowledge. Am I having any kind of like live well built into that or am I like dragging a flow troll? Um, most people, there are a few companies that make live wells for kayaks and they're they're, they're fairly expensive. You know, you're 270 up to $400, <laughs> you know, they're, they're pretty expensive. Um, there is the old five gallon bucket and a bubble buddy. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, there's one in your garage and bubble buddies are 20 bucks at Texas tackle, right? <laughs> that, boom, you're done. Um, I've done flow trolls too. And dragging a flow troll, even pedaling a kayak, you can feel it. Okay. Like That's, it's quite a bit of drag, but then I kind of thought, it's smaller than a five gallon bucket and there's a lid for me that I can stick my hand and get bait out of. So I drilled a hole in the top of the flow troll, put the tubing in, then put the little aerator stone on. I've just made a smaller compact package gotcha. and I can still have live bait with me. Um, and there was one company and I haven't seen much of them. I think they were called the bait torque, the bait torpedo. And they designed theirs to actually more aerodynamic, more, Aqua dynamic, I should say, not aerodynamic, where when you started paddling, it just went under the surface and you didn't feel a lot of drag. I think it was kind of one of those online only things, but it, was, right. it was kind of an interesting, you know, you know, riff on the remedy of dragging a flow troll behind you. And can I even think about standing up to fish docks in the ICW around Wilmington, Wrightsville Beach in the summertime? Yeah. The boat traffic isn't going to make it a you sit folly down. waiting to happen. You sit down. Okay. Yeah. Or, I mean, there's sometimes you just, like, watch, like, this guy's not going to sit down. And then you just pause. <laughs> I mean, when it's slow, because we all stop for train wrecks. Yeah, we do. We, 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 it's, it's, it's ingrained in us. We all stop for the accident. Ooh. And boats typically slow down for kayak fishermen. They do. And I think, you know, just, just the general rule of thumb is just yield to the lesser vessel. So, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there are people that don't. And that's fine. Now... I guess give me a little bit of like the advantage that I have with being a kayak fisherman beyond the docks. Like now if I'm going behind some of those creeks behind Masonboro or, you know, Whiskey Creek has some deep water in it. I'm thinking yeah. more like the Masonboro, 
you know, s- sell us a little bit. What's the what's the advantage of being on a kayak? You're gonna get you're gonna get more fishing opportunities. You're gonna get to places you can't get to on a boat, uh, even on a flats boat. You know, if you if you're going up one of those small feeder creeks that's leading up towards the back of the island, fallen tide. There's a sandbar, no water, but there's water on the other side of it. I can get out of my cock and grab by the front handle, drag it over the sandbar, get back in and start fishing. Um, I think it's the fact that you can sneak into places. So you're slower. You know, I don't have a 90 horse in the back of my kayak. I have a left and a right arm. Um, so it's not like you're going to decide like, well, let's start a figure eight and work our way down a Carolina Beach Inlet. I mean, you're a stud if you can, but you're not going to. You're not going you're to. You're not going to. Um, and I think that kind of might, I might just go off on a quick little riff here, but I found that for me, kayak fishing has made me a little bit of a better fisherman because I just can't run to the next spot. Like I had to take a little bit of effort to figure out like it's this spot on a fallen tide in the summertime with live bait should be some reds. And so it's just like, if you go to Fort Fisher, you know, it's four miles to bald head. That's if I get in my fishing kayak and I'm pedaling, that's, you know, almost an hour. I'm not fishing. I'm trying to get, or if you're in a boat, you can get there in 20 minutes and you're fishing. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of forced me to think and pay more attention when I'm catching fish. Like I just caught a flounder here. What's going on? A tide's rising. There's a ton of bait. I was in the river and I was using a dark colored bait, you know, just to have this little mental checklist going on, like, like the five W's who, what, where, and when, why. And then you just kind of just keep that log in your head. So the next time that opportunity presents itself, like it's a rising tide. I'm in the river. I was using a dark bait a week and a half ago. I was catching pretty good, pretty good amount of flounder. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try for some flounder. Well, I'm a little disappointed. I thought you were gonna go off on a crazy riff, but that was actually a very sensible riff. Yeah, I try to. Well, that's what Billy's <laughs> for. The other guy. The other guy. The other guy. The crazy riff. <laughs> it's like the other guy. <laughs> With some mystique to it. <laughs> we might work that into our jingle that starts the show. The other guy. I like it. Yeah. All right. Hey, Fort Fisher. A kayak fishing destination. Yes. If I was saying, all right, Chris, I'm going to buy a whole bunch of kayaks. If you can help me catch a fish at Fort Fisher, where's the first place you're going to paddle? What's the first thing you're going to do when you leave the ramp at Fort Fisher? I'm going to work the wall closer to Zeke's Island in that first bay. And you're going to work it how? Um, If it's a lower tide and I want to work closer to the wall, I'm going to most likely throw a topwater, a suspending bait, like an MR, you know, 17, 18, 27 from Marilure or, um, or a pop and cork. Um, that wall's falling apart over time. I mean, the Corps of Engineers realized it wasn't going to do what they built it for, so why maintain it? Um, so, there's a, so, you know, fishing jig head on the bottom, it's a nut. Yeah, well, you'd be good at tying knots. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna leave a lot behind. <laughs> so I, when I'm fishing that, I, I, I want either, you know, surface sub, you know, subsurface or, you know, or a really slow sinking bait that I can just keep it up off the bottom. Um, that's going to be my first stop. Uh, I'm going to go down into the second bay. There's a nice line of oyster beds to your left as you're heading south. Um, there's a deep cut that runs along that grass bank when you first get into it. That can usually hold some reds. I found they're kind of dinky, like 16, 18 inches, but they're fun. I mean, it's a redfish. Yeah. But they're fun. Um, and then working the working that wall down there, there's a lot of great little spots. And I, I like to target a lot of places that have kind of bigger blowouts in the wall so when that tide comes in it it's coming through a bigger hole it tends to scour out a little bit around it so now you kind of have a little bit of a flat spot and you have a going down to a little bit of a you know into a deeper hole and then coming back up again so you have that kind of work the flat work the edge work the hole and work back out again so when i'm moving around from these spots and we'll just use this fort fisher you know sort of example um i'm trolling i'm putting a line out the back as i'm paddling from spot to spot and what am i putting out back you know, you could, you know, down there that is always decent bait down there. You can just, you can just drag a finger mullet or a mud minnow behind you. You could, you could drag something like a hard bait or, you know, um, one of my good customers, uh, always has a popping cork hanging off the back of his kayak. So when he stops to work a spot, the cork's already fishing. Um, usually I have to yell at him that his cork's underwater because he's <laughs> busy looking the other direction. But when I'm paying attention, he catches fish. All right. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, you know, why not keep a why not keep a line in the water? You, you're not moving that fast, you know, paddling. So it's it's almost redundant. Like you know, what if you just come across a spot that produces that you never knew about? Okay. I mean, sure. I think it makes sense to keep yeah. a bait in the water as much as possible. Yeah. I just want to know what was perhaps best practice for like my kind of throwing di- it off the back as I'm paddling from yeah. spot I mean, to spot. I, I would think it might dictate the, the water that you're in. If it's going to be like real shallow yeah. and stuff like that, maybe like a cork, you know, or okay. soft plastic. If you're going to be in deeper water, you know, maybe drag a usury behind you or something like that. You know, get down three, four feet when you're paddling. See what's happening there. Man, these were so that was a great answer for the Fort Fisher area, more specific than I thought you were going to get, which is fantastic. I know listeners, viewers are going to appreciate that. So, in that spirit, how about same question for like Carolina Beach or Carolina Beach State Park? What's the give me the first two spots that first two spots. you would target? I would if I'm Carolina Beach State Park, I'm going to fish around the beginning of Snow's Cut. Uh, the beginning like Riverside yeah Riverside and the only reason why I say that is you know Snow's Cut was man made in the 30s so the Corps of Engineers dug a trench so when the current changes in there it's it's moving pretty good and we we tend to recommend you know if people ask like where do I go well if you're gonna go down to Carolina Beach try to stay out of Snow's Cut I mean the middle the middle part of it um because you can get kind of pulled to the other side of it and that current's running hard enough you won't be able to get paddle yourself back so now you're stuck for six hours waiting for the tide to change so I tend to stay on the ends of it, you know. Okay. So, and I would say I would answer the question the same way if I put in a Carolina Beach, it Carolina Beach boat ramp. I'd fish the ocean side the, of Snow's Cut. The ocean side of Snow's Cut. Um, there's a lot of great, you know, old spoil islands around there. So around those edges, you know, um, the Brunswick County side. That's where the river channel is. So it's going to be deeper. The New Hanover County side is a little shallow. So it'll be a little bit more flat. So depending on what you're targeting, like, but this time of year, I I'd target more of the New Hanover County side. Uh, it's a little shallower for like the Reds and the Flounder than okay. I would, you know, towards the Brunswick County, the islands towards the Brunswick County side because the because the river channel there. Okay. And then how about, you know, if people are Hampstead, North Wilmington, what about, where where are you sending there? Sloop Point? I Is think Sloop, well, yeah, Lewis Road, but down Sloop Point, Lewis Road. That would be, you know, if you were to say like, I'm here, what's the closest to Hampstead? I would say Lewis Road off okay. of Sloop Point. That'd be closer than coming all the way down. Down then, this direction. And where are you going to have me? Give me two hot spots to paddle, you know, that area? Uh, out of, you know, you have Virginia Creek, uh, pretty uh, pretty well. Virginia Creek's just to the north of that ramp, um, which, is, which which branches off two different branches as you go, as you get up out of that main feeder part of the creek. Um, working, you know, again, there's a lot of houses. There's a lot of docks. There's a lot of boats. So why not work them? Um, if you wanted to get more in the marsh, I'd say pick a day you got some time. Take a right, head south, paddle down, work, you know, like you're going to go out uh, New Topsail Inlet and cut right in there behind Lee, Lee Island. You know, there's hmm. just vast marsh back there that I'm sure gets worked, but it's not getting worked like the marsh behind Wrightsville Beach. Agreed. You know, so that's going to take a little bit more time. You're going to look in maybe at a close to three mile paddle, but you know, you hit it in the morning, you catch it on a fallen tide. So you're riding the current down that direction, working the marshes and bring the bring the rising tide back home and get a free ride both ways so in i think we're headed to wrap this up so here's what my question is all right first off i'll ask anything that i haven't set you up to say in regards to advice for people who want to get started in inshore kayak fishing i think the first thing you need to ask is really ask yourself what do i want to do we get a lot of people say, yeah, I'm going to go offshore. Are you? Well, I'm, I might. Like, maybe in the spring for Bonita. But but are you? <laughs> well, I mean, I've done it on my friend's boat before. So so maybe you don't need that 13 and a half foot $3,000 pedal drive to go red fishing in. But if you, you know, if that's what you want, by, by all means, go for it. But I think you, that, that customer just needs to ask them. So, and then we can kind of help them drive them to that. Like here's like two, maybe three kayaks that are gonna fit what you what you want to do, and then there's gonna be something on one that they're like, I can't live without that, and that's the boat they go for. Um, and this is my soapbox: wear your life jacket when you are kayak fishing. That's there's no excuse anymore. Where oh they're hot, they don't fit. 
Well, then spend the extra 20 bucks and get a breathable one. You know, it, it's it's coming to the point now where it's not that orange ring around your neck. Right. They're cut and designed to fit adults pro- and children properly um, to be worn at all times while on the water. Um, that's just kind of my pet peeve. Okay. Like, I, I never fish without one. Um, I know a lot of the major manufacturers. You, say, you can catch the fish of your dreams. But if you're in your boat not wearing a life jacket, we ain't putting it in a catalog. Like they're like they're they're adamant about it too, mm-hmm. just just for safety. I guess that's it. my word. So that's my little soapbox. Word yeah, I've heard you say it before, man. I mean, with our winter fishing schools, you often want yeah, to go back in, to safety. It's important. Other than that, it just if you're going to go out at night, you have to have a light, three sixty. You know, we're kind of a John boat, less than a ten horse motor. If you want to get rules and regs about it, um, and pay attention to what things are going, what what weather and tide are doing when you get to a new spot. To know, like, you know, the river can get a little choppy on a falling tide and a southwest wind because they're opposing each other. So in the winter time on a rising tide and a northeast wind, it's going to be a little choppy in the river. You know, if you know what the tide's doing, what the wind's doing, when you get there, you can kind of be like, ooh, this might not be the right time to fish this place. So you're not trying to decide or driving all around New Hanover County looking for a, a calm spot to go fishing. All right. Good. Still good advice. Now, you're a kayak fisherman, you or your kayak fisherman that frequent hook, line, and paddle that you run around with. Give me, like, the highlight reel of the calendar year. They most like to do blank in the spring, blank in the summer, blank in the fall, and blank in the winter. All right. So, spring, still chasing trout, looking for reds, waiting for the flounder to show up. All right. We're middle of June, so it's, it's reds and flounder, you know. Um you got a shot some ladyfish. You want to go off for something. There's a lot of species you can do this time of year. Blues, all that kind of thing. You know, fall, hoping for those big flounder. Still chasing reds. Praying the trout bite turns on. Winter time, it's usually trout. Um, targeting trout. It's a little bit less of a diehard crew. Um, back to safety. We always recommend, you know, splash top, splash bottoms. Um, waders and raincoats don't work. They'll keep you dry, but they don't work when you fall in. Um, so, yeah, it's mostly, you know, falls trout. Uh, in winter's trout um, with an occasional redfish because they hang around. If you're willing to, willing to work them slow enough, you might get lucky picking up a red. All right, and now give me a review. I know that hook, line, and paddle is much more than just a place to go buy a fishing kayak or get consulted on a fishing kayak and accessories. Give me the give me the review of hook, line, and paddle, man. Give me the rundown of all the things that you guys are doing. So we do you know recreational kayaks also uh, into light touring. So if you're not a fisherman, we're still able to, to, to facilitate your needs. Um, been kind of sniffing around. I'm not sure how many shops in town are, are, are really still doing a lot of paddle boards, but it's been strong for us. You know, and again, we're doing more family, family, recreational paddle boards, not the, you know, super expensive $3,000 race boards. You know, we're trying to target that, you know, mom, dad, two kids. We need, we need some, we want some go get outside and have some fun affordability. Um, some of our stuff's a little pricey, but all our brands are, you know, my two major kayaks I sell are uh, North and South Carolina built. One's in Greenville, South Carolina. One's outside of Asheville. So life jackets are based in Asheville. Paddles are based in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So we try to keep it U.S. based. And these are, you know, small family companies making a quality product. And I'm a small business trying to sell you a quality product. And I think a lot of people think like, well, X Place has something like it for 500 and yours is 1,000. Well, X place is nothing like what I have and it's better quality, better engineered and, and better built. And sometimes I, I make the joke like, yeah, you're my one time customer. Like unless you change into a different style of paddling, you won't come back in again because we got you set up for what you need and right. with a little bit of care, you know, I have kayaks 12, 13 years old. They still work, still fish them. Um, just rinse them off, keep them out of the sun. You know, it's not, it's not disposable. It's not two, three seasons. I got to go back and buy another one. It's the little bit of care and maintenance, and they last a very long time. You do any uh, paddles, any instructions, any? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about a kayak charter, man? If yeah, I want, do, if do. I want someone to hold my hand and we show me the you ropes. Out. Yeah, we take you out, show you the ropes, um, get you on the water. I, you know, being that we do it in kayaks, and we're not covering a ton of ground that like you can in the boat. We kind of, we kind of set it as is is a is a five hour trip. Okay, that's about. I think for a first person getting out fishing like that in a kayak, five hours about is about <laughs> as long as they want to be there without being held hostage. Um, Billy ain't going five hours. No, no he's, not, he's hours, not going no. five hours. I'll bring him a sandwich. He might, but he's not going five hours. <laughs> a big sandwich. Yeah. A big sandwich. I'll cut it in half. And an hour yeah. to eat it. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, that, and then we do tours, uh, eco tours. We like to do, uh, you know, the lower part of the Cape River below downtown. Um, Masonboro Island's a popular trip for us. It's a little tide dependent, um, and we usually offer that trip in two veins. We let the customer choose. We wind around the marsh for quite a while, checking stuff out, go see the island, get back, wind around the marsh for a while, or just get over there, spend as much time on the beach as you want to, and then come back. Right on. Man, Chris, this has been a great talk, man. Yeah, I've enjoyed. I appreciate it. I mean, I'm certainly wiser when it comes to kayak fishing now. I mean, yeah. I'm almost embarrassed how little I knew before <laughs> talking to you. And I've known you, I don't know how many years many, and many had years. you at the fishing school. I don't know how many years. Oh, so you're always busy getting the food out for us. I am busy with so the food. Can't attend these. And the coffee. Yeah. Can't attend these classes. The donuts. donuts. <laughs> the donuts. <laughs> donuts. <laughs> My favorite part. Yeah. Chris, we're going to talk again. Yes. Hopefully, you know, whether it's back here in the studio, whether it's at hook, line and paddle, we're yeah. going to talk again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Right on. And the other guy. The yeah. other guy. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, man. Thanks, Chris. That was good, man. Yeah, thanks, Billy. Oh, no, other guy, please. Oh, other, please. Call me by yeah, my first the name. The other guy. The other guy. Billy's, I mean, other guy's best takeaway just doesn't have the same <laughs> ring as Billy's best takeaway, though. Oh, yeah. Okay. So as much as I love this joke of the other guy, and oh, I'm, by man. no means have we seen the end of it, oh, I'm going to still say, hey, Billy. It's that time in the podcast when I ask you for Billy's best takeaway. Uh, this is, Maybe not even a takeaway, but maybe just a reminder. I, I like the safety first, wear your life vest, and just be reminded of that because it's so easy when I get in a kayak, my kayak, my friend's kayak, I just go, oh, I want to be super comfortable and take it off, and then sometimes I've been you know, in a certain situation. So I think that's important. I think that's like sounds dumb, but Chris is right, man. Like I was fishing a kayak tournament that they put on a couple of years ago, and uh, he was like, "Yeah, the life vest." I'm like, ah, "I got something." He's like, "Nah, dude, you need to wear one the whole time." Like, and I did. I got in a situation where I needed my life vest, so it's good, good stuff, good takeaway. It's sage advice. I think part of you answer that just to make your wife happy if she watches this podcast. Yep. So she'll let me go out on the water again. That's so what it is. I can't. I mean, that's sage too. I don't even really care about safety. I just said that for why purposes. <laughs> Wrap us up, Billy. Wrap us up. <laughs> well, once again, I want to give a big shout out to Marine Warehouse Center here in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, those guys are awesome, man, supporting the show, being first adopters to the show. So we really appreciate that. And if you're watching and you want your business to be on the show, you want to sponsor the show, uh, get in touch with me. My email is in the show notes in the show description. It's Billy at Fishman'sPost.com so we can make sure that happens for you as well. Uh, we're always looking for people to be a part of the community, be a part of the sponsorship. So really appreciate it. And then uh, also one more time of how to watch, how to listen. Right here we go. Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, Google Play, Music, and then YouTube. And be sure to subscribe and share. I've made it really easy, Gary, in the show notes for people to copy the link and share it, that episode with their friends. So um, our, our community is growing, man. We've, we're growing thousand people already on instagram and over 300 and something subscribers on youtube at this point so super awesome and grateful that people come check us it's out it's been fun it's been rewarding like i'm you know i love positive feedback i mean i appreciate yeah. any feedback i appreciate all feedback but uh, of course we easy. love positive feedback and there's been plenty of it which makes yeah. this it does it makes it rewarding. it makes it fun man and we're always tweaking always adjusting always adding equipment and doing all kinds of stuff so that's part of my job is making sure we look good and sound good so that's right, man. All right. Thanks a lot, Gary. That's it. All right. Next time.